Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and with me tonight is Turton Fan of the Divide Line fame. How are you doing today? Doing great. It's not our first time doing a show together. I think we've done a couple in Reason Theology, but it's a, our first with a debate. Uh, and sadly, we're supposed to have a moderator, but he stood us up. So we're just going to go with the honor system tonight. But as we we're discussing off there, I'm presuming you're the experienced debater. You'll, you could be the strict one with times. Okay. That sound good? Sounds great. All right. So just so the audience knows, we are debating tonight whether or not the veneration of the Theotokos is an ancient and apostolic practice. Uh, anyone who's well read in this topic knows that's an uphill battle, battle for anyone who's Orthodox or Roman Catholic to argue, but we'll try to make this interesting tonight. We will start with two seven-minute open opening statements, two seven-minute Q&A sessions, five-minute closed statements, closed statements each. And if you guys have questions, we will answer them for as long as uh, time permits. We won't go crazy. Uh, we both have families and things to do and stuff like that. Now, did we decide who's going first? <laughs> I don't remember it, doing that. It should be you uh, since should you're- you're the uh, affirmative here that it is an ancient and apostolic practice. All so, right, you got sure. it. So I will get started. It's a 7.15 here. So anyway, I'm going to argue tonight that the veneration of the Theotokos, prayers to her, the honoring of the Theotokos is a apostolic practice that's evident in the ancient church. I'm not going to try to argue that, well, you could find it happening once in the 5th century, so that must mean it's also the 1st century. We have to have an appreciation for how long a century is. A lot could change in a couple decades. Well, remember COVID? A lot could change in a year, let alone centuries. And so I have an uphill battle to establish historically that the Venerish Theotokos is ancient and apostolic. So I'm going to start tonight by making a biblical case. And I'll give the highlights. The scriptures themselves have a high Mariology. 2 Samuel 6, 9 and Luke 1, 43 obviously will conflate the Theotokos with the Ark of the Covenant. And when we see the striking of Uzzah in 1 Chronicles 13, 10, that very much implies that you cannot defile the Ark of the Covenant. So obviously, we would think that they would understand you can't do the same with the Theotokos. Now, I think there's a more important scriptural event that I've never seen spoken about in apologetics, which is the overshadowing of the tabernacle in Exodus 40, 29 in the Masoretic text, in the Septuagint in the Masoretic text, I think it's verse 35. There's also an overshadowing of the temple complex in 2 Chronicles 7, 2 to 3. Now, the importance of this it's a term overshadowing the Septuagint, particularly in Exodus 40, 29, the Septuagint. It's the same Greek word as in Luke 135. So when the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Theotokos that you conceive, well, this is the same thing that happened to the tabernacle. What is happening? Well, we believe it's a purification of Theotokos, and it's an, uh, a per purposeful parallel between the Old Testament by St. Luke. Now, there's issues that say saints can't discern thoughts, so why, why bother venerating them and praying to them? But the scriptures are very much against this. The saints discern thoughts and perceive events, as Elisha does in 2 Kings 5.26. The deceased saints pray in heaven, like in Revelation 8.3. They pray in response to receive, uh, perceiving events on earth, such as in Revelation 6.10, when uh, the, the martyrs pray for an end of the... Uh, the ruling of those who are persecuting the Christians. And also those in heaven are compared to the angels in Mark 12, 25. And we know that angels are aware of events on earth. Now, not only this, I believe Psalm 45 contains a very important allegory, which is most plausibly, not indisputably, about the Theotokos. Now, the Psalm contains God in verse 7, who is called the king in verses 1 and 5. And we know that in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9, they, they explicitly say this king slash God is Jesus Christ. Now, the king has daughters of kings among his ladies of honor, right? Daughters. And 
a queen in gold of Ophir in verse 9. So who are the daughters and who is the queen? So let's talk about this. The king desires the queen's beauty, which allegorically must be a reference to the holiness and not the spiritual beauty in verses 10 and 11. And who better than she who is higher, highly favored, which Theotokos in Luke 128, to whose blessed among women, said twice in Luke 128 and Luke 142, and of whom all generations call blessed in Luke 148. Now the queen has those who seek her intercession. In verse 12 in Psalm 45 says, the people of Tyre seek your favor with gifts. And she has followers among called the virgins, which I believe interpretably are the daughters, her companions who follow her, according to verse 14. So aren't the virgins typologically the 144,000 virgins, virgins in Revelation 14, 1 to 4? So the queen must be Mary and the daughters other Christians. If the queen is simply the church, who are the virgins led into the palace? What is the palace typologically? I would say the church. Now, let's talk about the historical case of Marian veneration. We just gave some scriptures. Well, in the second century, we have two proofs. There is uh, Oda Solomon, 197, calls Theotokos a mother of great mercies. And the Gospel of Bartholomew, which is uh, considered to be from the second century for many scholars, such as Stephen Schumacher, speaks of uh, a, pr a prayer to her womb. And so we have two Marian prayers from the second century according to mainstream scholarship. We have archaeological evidence. Now, some people say first century. I think it's too early. But of a third century grotto in Jerusalem where it says under the holy place of M, or probably Mary, I wrote there the whatever, it's missing in the Greek, the image I adored of her. So we know there's an image. It was venerated. And we also know near this writing was something that said Hail Mary in the Greek. So we have this grotto in Jerusalem where Mary was venerated. We also have the fourth century subtum presidum. That's a prayer that says, oh, mother of God, rescue us. We have the anaphoras of Coptic basil that say the holy and glorious Mary, Theotokos, and by your prayers have mercy. About 2% of all pre-Nicene hymns and 3% of all pre-Nicene works by author contain Marian veneration. Now, this is not surprising because we have prayers to to the saints in Maccabees 15, 14, speaks of Jeremiah, a lover of brethren, who prays much for those people and for the holy city to it, Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Jeremiah 42, 2 says, pray to us, Lord, your God, about Jeremiah. So we can see how the Jews interpreted this in 2 Maccabees 15, 14. They're still praying to him. We have in the prayer of Azariah in verse 64 in the Septuagint version of Daniel, the, uh, a prayer to the saints and to the angels. We also have uh, Jesus on the cross when he's uh, praying to God and saying the psalm, they think he's asking for Elijah's intercession, but no one takes issue with this. There's several Talmudic attestations covered by Israeli scholar Bar of Lan, um, one being a Palestinian Amariam that has prayers of the dead at the cemetery sites. Why else would the scriptures locate where people are buried. And Genesis Rabbah from the 5th century, which speaks of Rachel um, and her crying for those, her children, and they say this is pertaining those seeking mercy for them, I'm quoting. And so now this makes sense of Matthew's citation of the slaughter of the innocents, quoting that part of Jeremiah, because the Jews understood that to be the saint, um, Rachel, praying for the children. So I think I might have went over, so I will keep it there. And um, I will give seven-minute opening statement now to Turton Fan. Thanks very much. As far as I could tell, you were very punctual, so I'll try to be punctual as well. There are... Uh, the question for tonight's discussion is whether the veneration of Mary is ancient and apostolic. I would answer that question the first part about it being ancient with an affirmative answer. Yes, it, it's an ancient practice. I, from in my mind anyway, the fourth century is still an ancient time. And we do have examples from the fourth century, particularly towards the end of the fourth century. In fact, there's a famous heretical sect 
the Coloridians who worshipped Mary as a goddess. Uh, that it's described, or at least Epiphanius of Salamis, around that writing around that time, described such a sect. Whether or not they actually existed, people you know debate back and forth because there's not not much other evidence of them, as with so many ancient sects that have since disappeared. However, uh, ancient that, that may be ancient but that's not apostolic. The Coloridians, for example, are a clear example of someone who's not following the teachings of the apostles. And there's no big debate that the Coloridians are a heretical sect. I don't, I, even those who uh, di might disagree whether or not they existed wouldn't say if they existed, they were Orthodox. This is clearly an improper uh, act that they were doing. They were worshiping Mary and not uh, under the cover of making a distinction between Latria, Dulia, and Hyperdulia, or or any similar distinction, they were uh, baking cakes to her, if I recall correctly, and it seems to be uh, very clearly anticipated by Jeremiah talking about worshiping the Queen of Heaven. In any event, whether or not the Coloridians existed at that time, there was certainly the idea of worshiping Mary, as evidenced by Epiphanius of Salamis' rejection of that in that time. And there were other acts and deeds that occurred at that time, sometimes in churches that were much more sound, that, uh, that took it too far, that took the uh, honor and respect given to the mother of Jesus too far. And uh, some of those include the Subtuum Presidium, as an example. Uh, but we, can, we also see other examples as well. The, my point is not to debate anything from the fourth century onward, because in fact, there is such uh, practice. My question is whether it, it preceded the fourth century in any meaningful way, and more importantly, whether it was tied to the apostles. If it were apostolic, we would expect to see the apostles teaching it, but we don't. The apostles never give us any hint or suggestion to pray to anyone except to God. There's prayers mentioned to Jesus, to the Father, but not uh, any to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's proper to call her the mother of God as, as it's understood that it's because Jesus is God and not because she somehow created the divine. The, uh, the question of whether there's some scriptural basis for interceding to or requesting the intercession of departed people in general. Once again, there is no example in the canonical scriptures of the apostles reaching out in prayer to anyone but God, not to Moses, not to Elijah, not to uh, even, even on the Mount of Transfiguration, we don't see the three trying to speak with Moses and Elijah, they speak to Jesus. And that's when there's an appar uh, some kind of uh, apparition or actual embodiment of those uh, departed believers there. Still, the apostles don't, aren't described as talking with them or trying to interact with them or asking for their prayer or anything like that. So, and subsequently in the, new, in the Acts, we have no similar examples. And uh, interestingly, uh, Mary isn't a central figure in the New Testament after the resurrection of Christ. She's mentioned briefly in Acts, at the beginning of Acts, and then she disappears. Some people have said, well, there's no mention of worshiping Mary in the form of offering her prayers. And I'm using worship broadly to include Dulia, Hyperdulia, anything, uh, not, not only, any form of cultus, not only the, uh, not only the worship due to God. Uh, but in any event, there's no examples of that in the New, in the New Testament. And some people have suggested it's because she was uh, still living. And to my mind, if you're going to raise that as the defense, then you should ask yourself uh, why, it, why that should matter. In other words, would it be prop if it's not proper while she's alive, why would it be proper subsequently? If, on the other hand, it is proper subsequently, um, Again, why would it be proper? Why wouldn't it be proper while she's alive? 
Uh, there's no scriptural rule that says you can't do you can't ask people for intercession while they're alive, but only after they've passed on. And so uh, again, we we see that there's not a strong biblical case there. However, there was some form of biblical of uh, Marian veneration in the scriptures. It wasn't the apostles, but there, it's reported that uh, while Jesus was preaching, uh, he was interrupted and it was told him that. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, let's see if I can find one. Uh, uh, perhaps I don't have a great example handy, but uh, the 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 example would be uh, that someone praised him, saying, "You know, blessed or, blessed is the womb that bear for you," or uh, and that pray that statement was responded to by Jesus, not by saying, yes, yes, praise Mary, but instead by saying that, uh, blessed rather are those who obey. And again, in another occasion in the Gospels, when Jesus was approached with a comment that his mother and brethren are there, he again deferred to the importance of believers above that of his mother. Uh, so in general, Although there's some ancient veneration, it's not apostolic, and it's not something we should follow. All right. I'm guessing you see the rest of your time, or you actually time it. You know exactly what it is. <laughs> All right. So now we'll begin two five-minute rebuttals. Um, I will start now. Now, I think when interpreting this issue, it's very important to ask yourselves, a few things. First, why was this practice, if it was so aberrant, so mainstream so early on? Now, this is not only evidenced by like relics, random prayers written in the catacombs, which is like half a dozen. Not even like, for example, St. Hippolytus in his commentary on Daniel as a prayer to the three youths. And that's from the early third century. So it's not just strictly that we also, the Acts of Paul and Thecla have prayers to the saints, and that's in the late second century. But we have church-wide documents of a somewhat important, they would have been, everyone in the church would have been reading these things that make mention of prayers to the saints. So for example, in the synodical letter of Constantinople I, now granted it's late fourth century, but it says in the synodical letter, may God by the prayers of the saints show favor to the world. And in the minutes of Ephesus II, which is not a ecumenical council according to Orthodox, but it was a very popular council in its day in 449 AD, has a prayer, Holy Rabulus, intercede with us. And so someone may say, well, that's so long after the apostles is irrelevant. The issue is how, how did it become so unanimous where you have these councils, particularly Council of One and then Chalcedon, which you couldn't even understand what the scriptures teach because they contain all of small Orthodox Christianity's Christological doctrines. It's where the same century we get our biblical canon from. How do we trust the people that gave us the biblical canon if they all universally prayed for the saints? You know, it's like saying we're going to take the religion of these apostate syncretist Christians. It doesn't make sense. So that's one thing we have to ask ourselves. The next thing is this, the burden of proof. And the burden of proof sounds like it's on me because I'm trying to prove a positive case. But the teaching of the Orthodox Church is the universal teaching of Christendom until the Protestant Reformation. And so that's not to beat up in Protestants. It's more to speak of this, the geographic and cultural diversity, Ethiopia, India, Spain, Britain, obviously Greece, um, Israel, everywhere was venerating the Theotokos. And so if this is the default of everyone that have inherited the scriptures until the 16th century, and we have any evidence that is third, second, or first century, if we were studying any other historical topic, for example, the history of Greek polytheist theistic religion, and all we had were one or two documents spanning over centuries, but they're consistent. And then after several centuries, everyone says universally it's the same thing. Historians would would take a wild guess and go, must have been the same because we don't have better evidence. 
So I would say, historically speaking, you might not feel the evidence is good enough to convince you personally, but that's your own personal criteria. By the criteria of professional history, it's the default. And so to prove against the default, you would need overwhelming evidence. So I would say the burden of proof would be on the Protestant side. Um, my last note would be prayers and songs and things consistent with veneration tend not to be written because they tend to be memorized. Paper was very expensive back then. Paper adjusts for inflation. Uh, a book would have been like $10,000. So you're not going to write down in a book something unless it's ultra important. Uh, apologetic work that rich people trade with other rich people like philosophers, like uh, something written by Origen. Uh, the scriptures themselves because they're used liturgically. You're not going to have something that is th that song. You know, that's why there's so few songs. I I'm going to ask you this, which would be how many songs about God do we have? A lot less than people think. How many prayers about even God do we have pre Nicaea? A lot less than you think. It's only after the persecution church ended and there's a lot of Roman money behind it that all of a sudden we have enough documents to show the broader teaching of the church. And my last thing I'll show before I see the rest of my time is this prop, which is my prayer book. I've shown it before. This book is not going to survive in an Egyptian desert under the sand. It's well used because it's prayers. It's how prayers are used. They're used all the time. Same with songs. Compare that to something that would be replaced all the time because it needs to be like the scriptures or expensive apologetic works owned by rich people. Those things are going to be preserved by history. So the fact that between two to three percent of all our extant sources are Marian prayers is actually kind of high considering they would have been this of the ancient times. It would have been very unlikely to last. So I think I took too much time. So I will stop there. So to tur uh, Turretin fan, it's now your turn to take five minutes or so. If I ripped you off time, please take it for a rebuttal. Thanks. Let me uh, begin my rebuttal by addressing some of the question of the parallels, right, the alleged parallels. The main thing I would note here in the interest of time is none of these parallels are are explicitly identified as pointing to Mary by the New Testament authors. There's a number of speculations that, for example, uh, there's some symbolism that can be drawn between the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the, the word of God, at least in the form of the Ten Commandments, where, and Mary's womb, which contained Jesus. And there's a very natural way of trying to make that association, although uh, at the same time, there's other ways in which the, the Ark of the Covenant can also be, be a reference to Jesus. There's many ways to apply these symbolism. And it, a lot of that application of symbolism when there's no divine warrant is simply a matter of someone's creativity. And, un, and that's not a solid reason to adopt a position. Uh, the next uh, issue I'd like to address, the same point on overshadowing. Again, I, although the term overshadow may be the same exact Greek word between the two, uh, that doesn't necessarily imply that there's an intended symbolic link between the two. It's, it may simply be, it could simply be a, a just a coincidence, or it could just be that uh, God's presence can overshadow various things and not just uh, only the same thing. The next point was the question of uh, some of the use of the non-canonical portions of the Old Testament, and I say non-canonical meaning not part of the Jewish canon, nothing that, that the Jews accept. Uh, I would be very curious to hear uh, when was the writing, uh, date of writing of the portion of Daniel that mentions prayers to angels and saints. Uh, but in any event, uh, the uh, we I, to some extent, I would want to set this aside because there's some, it's almost a separate uh, and very interesting debate on the question of the ad admiration of angels. And I, if I recall correctly, there is some New Testament admonition specifically against that, uh, one that is uh, also problematic for um, many uh, mainstream churches. The, the next... Uh, the next comment I wanted to address was one about the prayers to the prayers of the saints mentioned in a late fourth century conciliar document. 
I do think it's an interesting point to raise. I think there's probably two ways to interpret it. One would be that there's it's simply a statement of, of hope and expectation that the prayers of the, the saints, either the saints who are living saints or more likely the saints who are already in heaven with God, that they would uh, answer this. What's more probably more significant to this particular discussion is the absence of it saying Mary and the saints as uh, you know, why not specifically ask for Mary's help in that particular case? Uh, but in any event, uh, again, like I said, that's late fourth century. And, and by that time, there was some, uh, it had already started to creep in. So, for example, you don't see it as much in somebody like Augustine. Uh, I can't recall offhand any case where Augustine ever mentions a prayer to Mary or Mary in prayers. Uh, but whereas later authors, in especially, for example, throughout the Middle Ages, you will find lots of authors talking about prayers to Mary. Um, and so it did It did eventually become widespread. How did it become so widespread? Uh, how did it become universally accepted in some sense among many churches? Or how could it be the universal teaching of the churches? And uh, first of all, I would, I would step back and say that there is, has not quite... Uh, all of the churches have always been uh, aff uh, afflicted by this particular mistake, but certainly there have been many. Uh, there have been some centuries where many of the churches, throughout, for example, throughout Europe, almost all of the churches would have accepted this as appropriate practice and indeed practiced it. So how could that be? How could that happen in the church? And the, it doesn't mean that everyone had to become apostate. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying simply that they fell into error. And the reason is because idolatry in, in all its forms is extremely seductive. That's why John warns us against it. As for the cost of books and so forth, we have enormous volumes of Origen's writings, of Augustine's writings. Uh, and if, if we, it's not because books were so super expensive that we don't have the discussion of Mary. We just don't have it because it wasn't there at, in those centuries. Um, and I'll yield back any more time. I think I have only a few seconds. So that few seconds could have changed your life, and you gave them up like they're worth nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All righty. So we'll start our first seven minute QA. Uh, who asked the questions, you or me? You decide. Uh, let's see. You should be getting the last word with the final conclusion since you got the first word. So I guess. Uh, I will ask you questions, and then All you right, can ask so, me questions, and then we'll do the rebuttal or the conclusion. All right. So how about you get started? Sounds great. And let me just set my timer for seven minutes because I will lose track. All right. So my first question to you is, when do you think the portion of Daniel that you were uh, quoting from, when, when do you think that was written? Uh, second, the first century BC in the Greek language. Okay. Uh, do you believe it was written by Christians or by uh, by believing Jews or, or some other group? Had to be believing Jews because it was first, second uh, century BC. It could have been in Israel because I think Greek was more widely spread and used in Israel than some people popularly think, but it, it could have been in the diaspora as well. Okay. I must have misheard you uh, when you said BC. Sorry about that. B uh, Sorry about that. Though. The uh, the question of uh, this practice of praying to Mary as an example of Marian veneration. Uh, when you say that there's two percent of the prayers are Marian prayers, uh, it seemed from the examples that I'd seen before in what you've written that. Uh, there aren't there aren't really any of those prayers from before the fourth century. Is that is that accurate, or do you have some in mind that are before that that time? Yeah, let's take the time to flesh out the dating and okay. give all sides of the issue. So not too much time because this is your time. I count two from the second century. One, uh, Oda Solomon, nineteen seven, and so I don't. I'm not aware of any debate on the debating the Odes of Solomon being really past second century early third, late first, but I think second century is a pretty safe dating. Gospel of Bartholomew, there's quite a bit more diversity, though I'm going by the dating of Stephen Schumacher in my own reading of uh, of a lot of these uh, gospels where really second, third century, you don't see as much of it in the fourth. The Grotto in Jerusalem 
which has uh, a prayer and Hail Mary, that's dated first the third century. I read a critical book review um, of uh, Bug uh, Bugatti's, that's the archaeologist, his book on the issue. And they said it was pre-Byzantine. So likely would that mean before the year 450. And so I'm going by a date range of first, third century. Uh, but someone very critical say at least before 450. And so that would be all the pre-Nicene hymns and uh, prayers plausibly. While, you know, like Subtum, Presidum, Anaphoras of Coptic Basil, which I dated to the 4th century, though some people say Subtum, Presidum, O Mother of God, Rescue Us, is from the 3rd century based on handwriting evidence. I tried to give us some moderate dating. Um, and so, and it's also possible the Anaphoras of Coptic Basil will slightly find themselves after Nicaea, though I, I actually think that's unlikely. But, so we have quite a few that would be arguably before Nicaea. Okay, so... Let's uh, start with the uh, the odes of Ode of Solomon nineteen. Yeah, uh, this is one. This is a, a writing that uh, let's let's take for granted that it may be in the, the second century. But when you, when you describe it as a Marian prayer, as far as my reading of it, at least in the translation that I've seen, and I, I haven't pulled up the the Greek upon which this was based. None of this is directed to Mary. It simply mentions Mary. Is that correct? I would agree. It's a hymn. It's about the birth of Christ. And in this hymn, it speaks of the Theotokos painless birth. It calls her mother great mercies, which may be a reference to her intercession prayer. It may also be a reference to the fact she's the mother of Christ, which brings great mercy. Though the, the use of plural would be peculiar in that event. The... Uh... This is also uh, a document that's not believed to be of Orthodox Christian origin, correct? Not necessarily scholars on both sides of that. In my own reading, I've read all, I think it's, there's 42 Odes of Solomon. What throws a lot of people off is the kind of mother, Holy Spirit, mother stuff. But you actually find this in like Theophilus at Antioch and Irenaeus. You'll find this in other second century um, writings which we call consider small o orthodox. So I think actually for those who call it Gnostic, what they can't find is a Gnostic cosmology, which would make it necessarily Gnostic. While compared to, let's say, the Ascension of Isaiah, which is a first, second century work, which has high Marian uh, dogmas mentioned in it, that book's very obviously Christologically heterodox. And, you know, Christ is a created being and that has an angel Christology which is arguably proto-Gnostic, which is why I think you could arguably date it to the first century. But I would not say Old Solomon are demonstrably Gnostic. I think someone would have to prove that. Okay, so the idea of the, fa the ha father having breasts that exude milk, as in this particular ode, that's not something that you think is Gnostic? Or? Is it peculiar language which I would use, particularly in the context we have today? No. But within the context and time that they're writing, it is something that actually would have made sense. And for example, would I call Jesus Christ repeatedly a she in the books of Proverbs or in Wisdom of Solomon? Obviously not. They call, we know wisdom is Christ. The wisdom of God, of God is Christ because it says so in 1 Corinthians 1 to 2. But he's called a she. Wisdom is always called a she. And so sometimes in, in early Christian and Jewish documents, they word things in, in a peculiar sense, which we would find unacceptable, but it's because we generally have honed in our language in response to heresies. And presumably that sort of terminology wasn't problematic at its time. Is it problematic now to say that the son is the cup and the father is he who was milked and the Holy Spirit is she who milked him? Again, it makes me smile because, yes, it's very peculiar to speak that way today. But if you're speaking of the Father begetting the Son through the Holy Spirit, uh, because Christ is current the Holy Spirit, the, these are things that could be relevant, correctly understood. All right. And the Gospel of Bartholomew, uh, who, who is the one who you said dated that to, uh, and I suppose you mean the questions of Bartholomew, uh, not the lost gospel of Bartholomew. Uh, when... um, Dr. Stephen Schumacher. And, and just out of full disclosure, 
the Greek that has the prayer to Mary is in the Vienna manuscript. There's another manuscript that's Greek that doesn't have it. So it's one of those toss ups. And if you're, you know, which is actually the earlier rendering. Okay. And we're out of time for my seven minutes. All right. So we'll start with my seven minutes and now. All right. So how many prayers to God do we have before Nicaea that are copied? not in the middle of an apologetic work, which would have been to a specific audience, but just devotional prayers to God. It's a little bit hard to, in new, uh, to, to, sometimes it's a little bit hard to define what constitutes a prayer, and it's a little bit hard to index that kind of information. Uh, if we're broadly including hymns and songs, uh, of course we have 150 in the canonical scriptures that are to God. Uh, those are the a whole book of psalms, and those were sung in the early church. We are we have uh, evidence from the early church writings that those were the primary source of worship. And you, if you attend an Orthodox service, you find that's very frequently still used today in, in the litur liturgies that were generated in the I think maybe fourth or fifth century. So, like the Saint James liturgy, for example. Okay, but how about in extra biblical sources? We could agree to disagree based on typology that Psalm 45 has Marian veneration in it and, and stuff to that effect. But in extra biblical sources, in the document historical sources we have, how many devotional prayers to God do we have pre Nicaea recorded that are extant? I, I, I think it would be really hard to keep track of them. I'm thinking there are numerous. There seem to be, from my, my uh, memory, numerous examples in the in Augustine's Confessions, which is now in the you know we're talking in the fourth century. I'm trying to think what some examples would be before that in uh, you know, mixed into the writings of the earlier fathers and you know expressed in letters, for example. But I, I can't I I don't have an index of those of like all of the prayers from uh, from that time period. Yes, I, I think that, oh, wait, this is question, so I'm not going <laughs> to comment. Sorry about that. Let me ask you this. Revelation chapter 6, do you agree that the saints are interceding with God in heaven? Let me make sure that I'm, uh, that I'm finding the correct place. And this is uh, when you, you're talking about the... See, I'm trying to find in Re Revelation 6, which... 10, if I remember right. How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That prayer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's the martyr's prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so would you agree they're interceding uh, to God in that prayer? I, I believe that they're... In, uh, entreating God in that prayer. I don't think they're interceding per se, but uh, I, are they are they aware of the per persecutions on earth as they're entreating God for favor to end the persecutions? It's unclear what, what their understanding of what's going on outside of heaven is. Be what they are specifically requesting is judgment and a vengeance for our blood. That's how it's written, the first person plural, which implies that they're referring to themselves uh, and the there's yeah that's the um, and what they seem to be looking forward to is the end of the world the judgment day and so you're you're denying that where you're denying that they have understanding of what's going on in the world at that time that they're just they're just calling for their own vengeance um, to avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. They're just asking for vengeance for the people that hurt them, according to you. I, I'm, just, I'm saying that it is, the text doesn't tell us about their knowledge of ongoing activities, only about their own death and demise. And yeah. All right. And how about the other documented evidence we brought up even if you say you don't accept Second Maccabees, the additions to the um, Book of Daniel, 
would you agree that these are relevant early Jewish sources that give us a window into relevant early Jewish beliefs? I, I agree that they're rele relevant to the, the milieu in which the New Testament was written, yes. All right, and so being that they are relevant sources and they are speaking of prayers to the saints and to the angels, is it plausible in your view that this would have been within the intellectual mainstream of the Jewish apostles that have bequeathed to us the Christian faith? Uh, they, the, I would think that especially somebody like Paul would have familiarity with the book of Maccabees. I don't know whether he would know about, uh, you know, the, apocryphal portions of Daniel or not. But the keep in mind that I'm not quite as confident as you are that the that the like for example the Maccabees text supports the the idea of prayers to saints. But in any event, the uh, I, I think it the more that the apostles are familiar with that, the more surprising it is that they don't observe it or follow it if indeed they thought it was appropriate. Now, we talked about several Talmudic uh, attestations, to the prayers, the saints, and my question to you would be, are you aware of any, any early Jewish source that rejected prayers to the saints or angels? I'm not aware. Okay. Um, now, my question is, the biblical canons that we have now, what are the earliest that you're aware of and what gives you confidence in them? Well, each of the books has a, has a slightly different story to it. So, you know, the, for example, the canonicity of Genesis is attested for much, much longer than the canonicity of Revelation. And Revelation is self-attesting in, in an explicit way. This is the revelation uh, from, from God, whereas... Whereas other books of the uh, canon are less clearly and explicitly uh, self-attesting, so there is a very different answer for each. And there's if you if you're looking for a, kind of the answer of when's the first time there's a list that's a, a more or less the same list as as Protestants use today, for example. If you're looking at the New Testament, you find a list of the New Testament books, you know, as early as somebody like. Uh, if I recall, I may be misremembering, but if uh, I believe Athanasius' festal letter has a New Testament list that's identical with our New Testament list, I may be mistaken about that. Uh, but you do see like references to the four Gospels centuries earlier. So it's not as though the, the, the New Testament canon just kind of fell out of the sky in the fourth century. It was already attested to in, in even in the scripture itself where Peter writes uh, and describes Paul's epistles as scripture. So that's already in the first century while the, uh, while the scripture is still being written. And there's uh, the Old Testament canon, you know, has even has a different set of attestation because it was around, at, you know, even before the apostles. All right. It was, it was good that I asked my question like 20 seconds before it was done because it extended my minute by like a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so you will now have another seven minutes. You could time it if you want, and you could ask me questions. Okay. Uh, in terms of the question of this, uh, the writing on the wall in a grotto, my understanding is that this is, uh, that the, the based on the quotation you had provided, uh, my understanding is that you're re referencing actually a grotto of the Annunciation located in Nazareth, not in Jerusalem. I, am I correct about that? I believe so. I know it's called Grotto of Jerusalem. I would have to look again at the articles that I was looking at. Okay. If, if indeed it's that, uh, if it's merely pre-Byzantine, uh, then if it's the fourth century or so, that would still be, pre-Byzantine, is that, is that correct? 
That is true, yes. Okay. And I think we may have missed one important question that I was going to raise with respect to the uh, Ode, Ode 19 of the Odes of Solomon, it, which is, uh, in what way do you see this as a prayer uh, to Mary? Well, it would be making reference to her being a mother of great mercies, which would be a reference to intercessions. Great mercy, great mercy. I, I think there's even Psalms that say, you know, gods of great mercy, because we're speaking of one person. You know, great mercy speaks of, I think, multiple intercessions. So uh, in the... In the text of, so, it, well, before I get to the question about what the text actually says, then my understanding is that you're you're saying this is a an indication about such prayers, but it itself isn't the prayer. Yes, correct. Okay. Though, now, though it, it would be a devotional text, obviously centered upon that saying. Okay. Uh, the, the text itself says that... Uh, she, and that's referring to the Holy Spirit in verse 5, she gave the mixture to the generation without their knowing, and those who have received it are in the perfection of the right hand. The womb of the virgin took it, and she received conception and gave birth, so the virgin became a mother with great mercies, and she labored and bore the son, but without pain, because it did not occur without purpose. Uh, would you... Uh, would you see the mother with great mercies uh, being a reference to the fact that she was able to have a son without experiencing the trauma of childbirth? Well, I would say that is not the mercies because the fact that she conceived makes her the mother of great mercies. That's that's how to interpret that passage. Why are you saying mother of great mercies instead of mother with great mercies? Is it a I'm going by memory. I don't know. I don't have the Greek word in front of me in the interlinear. I'm going by, you know, not sure which Greek words use. Actually, I'd have to look. I don't know if Longfoot or who translated it. I'd have to take a closer look. Okay. Uh, when it says she gave birth like a strong man, uh, what does that mean? I'm presuming it's a reference to pain because femininity was understood to be a matter of weakness and squeamishness. And I think it's to emphasize that this was painless. And femininity was something that was uh, negative in the Gnostic understanding. Is that correct? I'm trying to remember, let's say the gospel of Thomas I believe you're right. I can't remember if there was just flat up gender flattening or if there was it was the female gender specifically. But even the male gender in in uh, because uh, the anthropology of Gnosticism was bad because the whole idea you could procreate and that you could be male and female was even bad. But let me just concede that to you. Say it was worse than. The female it's better than the female gender okay uh how do we, changing talk oh and i've lost track of the time unfortunately do you have a you still got another two and a half minutes or so 51 minutes in the live stream okay so keep going uh, the how did you count how could you count all the prayers that we have recorded for the first three centuries great question i read a book on it. <laughs> and the book lists the prayers, quite a bit of them. Uh, the majority are prayers to God and hymns to God. And, but a lot of the sources are also Gnostic as well. You know, so, but I'm counting those along with it. You just got to take them all and go, this is what we got. And it's about the number 50. So we have about 50 overall hymns to God or including Mary and Mary's in one of them. So that's how I get the number 2%. Okay. And that's for right. hymns. For, for the prayers, because how do you take a work like Origin Against Celsus or Against Heresies? They're massive. So I simply took all of the known pre-Nicene authors, and if 
one of those authors wrote something that was a Marian prayer. I included it against the total of authors. So that means this percentage of authors accepted Marian prayers versus the total amount of authors we have extant works from. And then that's how I came up with that number. Okay. I, th I, uh, is it possible that it wasn't intended as an exhaustive list of all of the prayers from those centuries? Um, I'd have to, I have her name, I think in, in the article that you read, uh, it was intended to be exhaustive, uh, though it became out of date because I think, uh, the onyx for his papyrus was discovered in the 1960s. So one or two came out since then, but ironically, almost most of the like discoveries, especially because of Otis Solomon all occurred in like the 1920s. So that all happened pretty early before the book was written. Interesting. I'm just thinking of the, uh, I'm thinking of how difficult it would be to go through all of the writings of the church fathers and take out the, the portions that are prayers, but uh, all right. Uh, these are just to clarify, these would be standalone, not specifically going through a letter from St. Cyprian to whomever in Spain, and then he gives a blessing in the end. So it doesn't include those. It's just standalone devotional text. I see. All right. If you took out this prayer uh, uh, or this Ode of Solomon from the list, where, where does that drop it in terms of the percentages? It would go down from 2%, go to 1%. Zero. 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 Oh, okay. Zero percent. Oh, okay. So uh, St. Methodius of Olympus has a hymn uh, of Thecla. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't make all of the hymns the saints disappear, but it would make the Marian ones disappear in the number. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we're, that, we're I over think time that's about if it. you want to yeah. switch. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, yeah. I think it's my last seven minutes, so I'll I'll now go. Um man, you 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 had me going there, so I can't really think of a question at the moment. Let me just make one up from the scene of my pants. Let's get back into the scriptures. Now, clearly, we don't have to have an existential crisis whether the book of Genesis is a scripture, right? I mean, that everyone agreed to that. Sad you see, Pharisee. Everyone agreed Book of Genesis is canonical. What we're more talking about is the fuzzy fringes of the New Testament canon, which I presume you have absolute confidence in the Catholic epistles, James, John, Jude, um, Peter. You would have absolute confidence in the Book of Revelation. Would that be correct? Yes, I believe those all to be the Word of God. All right. And what is your criteria that these books are indeed the, the, the word, the prophecy of God through the apostles? Uh, I find that uh, criteria way of saying it a little bit uh, potentially misleading. That said, in terms of uh, what is it, what scriptural doctrines are there that, that teach us uh, what scripture is, how does it function, what does it do? Uh, the scriptures are provided by God to instruct us in righteousness. And uh, so for one thing, any book that's potentially a book of scripture would have to have some kind of uh, doctrinal content. It's one of the reasons that Esther's so hard to, uh, had so much trouble getting into the canon is because it, it has, it almost appears, if you leave off the apocryphal portions, it almost appears as though it doesn't have anything uh, explicitly religious in there. And the, God, the doctrine of God's providence is really the, the primary doctrine taught by it, and it's taught very indirectly. Uh, but but the, so that'd be one aspect. It must have, it. God never contradicts himself. So any books that are, you know, potential candidates for this are, can't contradict what scripture teaches, what the other established scriptures teach. Uh, the uh, the word of God is, is something that will be received by the people of God. So the sheep hear my voice. And so any book that's long been neglected and ignored is something that's not scripture. So if someone discovers a book in the, in the deserts of Egypt tomorrow, and it says from Paul of Tarsus or Saul of Tarsus and, uh, and we see, and we recognize Paul's signature somehow, that there it is written in, in large writing, we still wouldn't treat it as scripture because it, it isn't scripture. And we know it's not scripture because it hasn't functioned as scripture for the last 2000 years. So I like the large writing reference because the end of Galatians continue. Uh, uh, so, 
Yeah. So there's, you know, there's, it may indeed, it's possible theoretically that it could be a, an apostolic letter and it would be of enormous historical significance, but it wouldn't be scripture because uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for, for doctrine, reproof and correction, instruction, righteousness. And uh, the purpose of, of God's word is to, uh, to guide and instruct the church. So any document that hasn't done that clearly isn't uh, part of the canon of scripture. Now, the, que the, the more tricky question is, what about these books that, ha that have been sitting sort of at the edge? They seem, they have sort of, they seem to have been, they seem to meet, meet all those descriptions, uh, but their acceptance hasn't been as widespread, uh, some as widespread as others. Well, it turns out in the New Testament canon that there's pretty widespread agreement among believers for, the, for most of the last few thousand years on most of the books. And then, of course, as you said, there's some fuzzy edges, maybe uh, some books that, that struggled for acceptance, um, perhaps Second Peter, some of the Catholic epistles, uh, the book of Revelation itself struggled in some places. Hebrews struggled in Rome uh, for a while, even though it may have well been written at Rome. Uh, but they're uh, ultimately the... These are the 27 that we accept are have been accepted by most believers down through history. Um, and then the question about the Old Testament canon comes up. And while there have been a, a number of additional books beyond the canonical books that have been accepted by many Christians, uh, kind of an, interest, an interesting and important question is whether they were accepted by Christ and his apostles. And there the evidence is that they were not accepted by them because they now let me interject here. Mm -hmm. So you said no contradictions. I what you don't mean by that is there's no apparent contradictions like the geneal geneal genealogies of Jesus, for example, right? There's difficult things hard to reconcile. Would you agree? I agree. And so to atheists like Bart Ehrman, um, they would not find the lack of contradictions to be a very compelling criteria because it does take quite a bit of faith and love for the scriptures to put the good hard work into reconciling th these things. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, I would also point out that you know, these are usually reconciling some details or nuances rather than reconciling the main story. So the main story of Matthew about Jesus coming and dying on the cross and rising on the third day is the same as the main point of Luke even though there are maybe some differences and some points throughout, including the genealogy. Now, you've made reference to that has to be received by the people of God. That's why we can't find 3 Corinthians tomorrow in the sands of Egypt. And, and even if it were authentic, receive it as scripture. So when were the scriptures demonstrably, right? We know when they were, right? When the apostles penned them, right? But when were they demonstrably so received by the people of God? Historically speaking, when would you locate that? Well, we see in one place in Paul's writings, he appears to refer to uh, Luke's gospel as scripture. And Peter's epistle, refer, one of Peter's epistles refers to Paul's epistles as scripture. As far as, uh, you know, the, the times when each of these, uh, each of the books got to be, you know, some, some level of, uh, acceptance. The it seems as though from if we're looking at like the historical uh, documents, as early as the writings of First Clement, most of the New Testament canon is uh, somehow alluded to or quoted from in that book. So the, if you go through and you carefully look at each of the phrases of First Clement, you see it refers not only to the, the letters to the Corinthians, which you'd expect, but also to uh, many of other of Paul's writings, and even to uh, a number of the well, other when books. would he locate the preponderance of these documents where it would become incontestable that um, that all these different books, 27 books in the New Testament, are in fact the New Testament? I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's like a, a bright line that we can draw that we would say at this point, uh, before that there was like pe reasonable people could differ. And after that, nope, there's uh, nobody could reasonably disagree. Ultimately, the, the point, the call of scripture is to people. The reason why John says at the end of the book of John that these were written so that you could believe and have eternal life. And that's the point of scripture being written is for people to read and believe and have eternal life. And the uh, you know, whether someone is, 
in their arrogance going to reject something that God has written is it's a serious sin on their part, whether they're doing that in the first century or whether they're doing that in the 21st century. But the uh, the weight of the historical acceptance by God's people is something that just continues to grow with time. It's not less now in the 21st century than it was in the 16th century or the or the uh, 11th century or any of the other previous centuries but you know by now the the number of years and the number of people who have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and also uh, recognized his voice in all 27 books the you know that number keeps growing so the weight of the evidence keeps growing and the kind in in some sense the less reasonable it is for someone to try to throw out one of those books now all right well we're out of time with the Q&A, so we'll start with the five-minute closing statements. I think you go first, he said. Yes, and unless there's some reason you'd want to do it differently. I mean, Norm, you should get the last word since I've I've tried to saddle you with the burden of proof. Well, you're the expert, so in, in debates and all other things, I'm sure. So how about you you go first then? Thank you. Yeah, I'm not the expert in all other things and uh, or not trying to be the one in here in debates, but in brief, uh, I think what uh, the question of the debate was, is the veneration of Mary ancient and apostolic? And if we say ancient and we mean fourth century, then I think we have agreement that it, there has been veneration of Mary since the fourth century. Uh, in my understanding, this kind of false worship is very alluring. And it is something that creeps in in, all, in, in many different ways. Uh, with for many different reasons, but it creeps in partly because of a human desire to worship God according to our own imagination and not to be limited by the word of God. Uh, it, that's not an appropriate desire. And it is good that in the Reformation, there was pushback to a practice that had been by that time a longstanding practice in uh, Western uh, Catholicism uh, that and it was also being practiced in other churches in that were not part of the Catholic Church. The Reformation was right to abandon this practice, however, because the apostles didn't teach this practice. They didn't provide an example of this practice. They didn't tell us that we should be praying to anyone who has departed, uh, and certainly not. They, they certainly didn't say we should be praying to the mother of our Lord. The Old Testament scriptures, uh, likewise, don't provide examples. Uh, it, for example, the Torah doesn't provide any examples uh, commanding the people of Israel to pray to anyone who has passed on. And even if historical uh, narratives in the Maccabees or historical narratives in the book of Daniel as, uh, as presented in the Septuagint, somehow provide an example of such a prayer that nevertheless, the, the scriptures don't teach us that such a prayer is appropriate or right. Mary is not given a special privileged place in the New Testament. In fact, when there was some very moderate uh, veneration of Mary presented in the New Testament, Jesus himself uh, quashed that. Uh, the earliest record we have is Luke eleven twenty seven. 27. It says, uh, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, blessed is the womb that bear thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But Jesus responded, yea, blessed are they which hear the word of God and keep it. And this, uh, this may not have been a phrase specially coined for Mary because in Luke 23, 19, Jesus flips it on his head and says that in these that the daughters of Jerusalem should weep because the times are coming when people will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. So it seems like it's a first century expression praising the woman, perhaps because of her son. Uh, but Jesus' response to that when it was applied to his own mother was to re redirect people back to obeying the will of the father, as he did again in Matthew 12, 46 through 50, when his mother and brethren came to visit him. People said, oh, your mother and brethren are waiting for you. And he said, who are they? Who are my brother and brethren? They're those who do the will of my father, which is in heaven. And so he redirects 
again, people to uh, not treat Mary or his brethren as especially special. Uh, we, we saw that there's an example of Coloridians, a very early sect that uh, did worship Mary, but that worship is inappropriate. Uh, we saw an example of the uh, Coptic liturgy, which, which you know, is uh, obviously not orthodox in terms of uh, how we would define orthodoxy, but the, uh, the practice even then, again, goes back to, the, let's say, the fourth century. So uh, uh, in short and in summary, the practice is ancient, if we, if, as we said, if we talk about the fourth century, but it's not an apostolic. It doesn't go back uh, to the first century, at least not in terms of being uh, something that the apostles did, practiced, approved of, exhorted, or taught. So it's not an apostolic tradition. It's a uh, human tradition that's grown up over the years, and it's appropriate for us to discard it and focus all of our prayers and other veneration on God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. So I suppose you see the rest of your time for your closing statement, and I will begin my closing statement I think tonight's which are very important. One is we're not dealing with tidal waves of evidence on either side. Actually, there's zero evidence for the Protestant side because they're arguing something is just not clear enough. They don't have any proof that anyone agrees with them. The evidence on the Orthodox side is relatively scanty, but for the reasons I brought up, it's understandable because we have only scanty amounts of devotional texts preserved for us that are pre-Nicene, which is their criteria that Turret and Fan is asserting that uh, is relevant for trying to discern if our practice is apostolic. Now, we have minor issues. Like you said, the Sahidic liturgy of Coptic pseudo-basal is not orthodox and it was before the schism between the Miaphysites and the Diaphysites, which is the Eastern Orthodox. So we wouldn't really consider anything really bad in it unless it contains prayers to saints and references to saints that we don't receive, but nothing doctrinally wrong. But that aside, when we have things in the scriptures, for example, like blesses a room and it appears that Christ gives a mild rebuke, we have to understand that Christ mildly rebukes his mother and the in other times, like the wedding of Cana, and the saints understand this as God showing grace to his mother because she is a human being. She can sin. She didn't sin. And God shows grace by sometimes saying a word in time before some bad thought or something could happen. So that's how Orthodox saints like St. Saint John Chrysostom would have taught, would have taught and understood about these events. But I noticed in the Q&A a significant kind of like, not intentionally, I believe that Turton Fan has given this very careful reflection, but an unintentional worming away from the obvious, which is the tidal wave of all documentary Christian sources is the fourth century. If everything after Nicaea just disappeared off the face of the earth, we could not understand the Christian religion, our whole context for understanding the canon, our whole context for understanding Christology, the procession of the Holy Spirit, so much of church would be incomprehensible without that context. It would be like trying to piece together what the Christian religion taught based upon scraps. But let's say all we had were those scraps. Well, what is in those scraps? Marian veneration, Marian doctrines, Marian prayers. That exists in those scraps. Not a lot, but what doesn't exist in those scraps is the Protestant view that you could have no belief in the intercession of saints whatsoever, because actually that'd be radically inconsistent with the Septuagint, which is Jewish, the, Tal the Talmudic sources, interior uh, uh, details within the Gospels themselves, like uh, Jews believing that Christ is asking for intercessions from Elijah, the prayers of the saints in Revelation chapter 6. The normative thing is that saints intercede in prayer. The normal thing is that we have any indication that the Theotokos intercedes in prayer. This we actually have evidence of. What we don't have evidence of is that the saints, and particularly the Theotokos, doesn't intercede in prayer. So I think that is the main issue. This is a universal practice from the whole Christian world until the 16th century. It's not good enough to say it's just not convincing to me enough. If 
if we were both Muslim and didn't, or or even better yet, we're both Buddhists and didn't really care about Christianity, we'd have studied it professionally, and we studied other ancient uh, religions, let's say the Hercules cult, and then you found out, oh, there's two sources two centuries apart that said Hercules had six fingers in his left hand and five fingers in his right hand, and then no one talks about it for another two centuries, and then all of a sudden everyone's talking about it, and everyone talks about it until the Hercules cult disappears. Well, based on three sources, people would reasonably assume, well, it must have taught that Hercules had six fingers on his left hand and five fingers in his right hand because we have no evidence to the contrary. And we're Buddhists. We don't care enough about Hercules personally, whether that's actually right. It's just the only evidence we have. So the this ultra high scrupulosity of Mary veneration only exists because people don't like it. If they were impartial, they would just accept it because it's the only evidence we have. It's what any unbeliever would accept because it's the only historical evidence that exists. But this ultra scrupulosity is actually irrational. It's understandable on an emotional level, but it's irrational and it's not justified by the discipline of history. Now, my last point, because I'm running out of time, is this Psalm 45. We, I think we see this right in the scriptures. The king's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also in your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robe of many colors. The virgins... Her companions who follow her shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing, they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. What else could that be but the church? Instead of your father shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. There's a reason why St. Gregory Palamas taught that this is about the Theotokos, because there's no other typologically consistent way to understand, well, who are these virgins brought into the palace? This is consistent with other scriptures that speak of the Gentiles being brought into Jerusalem, which is always understood about the Gentiles being grafted into the church. So the typologies there, the overshadowing of the tabernacle, exact same Greek word, the, these things are not coincidences. The universal practice in the Jewish sources, the Talmud, the Septuagint, that they believe the intercession saints, the Orthodox Jews still pray to the saints today, that there's all these references in the scriptures to where the tombs of the saints are, where you could find them, how they upkeep the tombs, they paint the tombs. The tombs are still with them to this day. They venerate the saints. Every indication is they venerate the Theotokos. And it appears to me unjustifiably scrupulous to say that they did not. And with that, I conclude this debate and we will move to uh, good old questions. How many questions do you have in you tonight, Turton fan? In terms of uh, any audience questions that may be there? How, how long could I take advantage of you and have you answer audience questions? <laughs> we, I, right now, I, I'm fairly open. I don't have anything immediately All after right. this. So. So, well, we'll take some time. I have a quiet audience. I'd like to think you and I wowed them so much. There's, They don't even know what to ask. There's too much information to take in. So we'll just ask a few questions. I think... You're more of the curiosity. I think they'll be more towards you. So what we'll do is we'll let you answer. I'll give a short rejoinder, and then you could give a rejoinder to the rejoinder, and vice versa if it's to me. So um, just to make it fun, here's a question. When Jesus prayed that we all may be one as he and the Father are one, didn't he mean all Christians in heaven and earth? And this is more of a general question. So how about we both answer that once? How about you first? I think the immediate uh, all that he had in mind there were the disciples that were with him uh, physically that day. But I do think it's applicable to more than that. And I do think that the universal church includes those who are already in heaven as well as believers who are here on the earth. Uh, where I, th I don't know if the question is trying to imply that we should all be one and therefore we should all be talking to each other. But the way that God has ordained, those who have passed on can't talk to us anymore. So the 
you know that that same kind of fellowship is lost in death but it will not be lost forever death will be trampled down yeah i would actually say i would interpret this this passage to be about um the communion of saints with the with those that are living i mean even protestants believe that the saints are doing something in heaven there's a sense we're one but i think the passage is more speaking about that there not be excessive divisions and heresies and the things have rendered the church asunder so i think that myself as an orthodox christian would be the canonical boundaries of the church uh for protestants who would be within the boundaries of right doctrine and right believing christian brotherhood if you know vaguely speaking i'm not trying to be derogatory i don't know how else to word it but right the invisible boundaries of the church the um let's see let's uh, can you ask him okay so in your opinion turton fan is praying to the theotokos wrong and why do you think it's wrong uh this kind of prayer is a something that when we pray, we are we should pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, which is our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. That form of prayer, not the exact words, but the form of prayer of addressing God, uh, the Father, is the is the appropriate and usual way that we should pray. It's also appropriate, of course, to pray to the Son and the Holy Spirit because they're also God. But there, there's no similar teaching that that Christ has given us to try to communicate with anyone who's passed on. We have some warnings in scripture explicitly about attempts to communicate with the dead. None of those, uh, the only text that we have where someone seems to have successfully communicated with the dead is going through the witch at Endor. And that's not uh, something that, sm that smacks us in the face and says, this is what you should be doing. Follow the witch of Endor's example, so. I, Especially because Endor has uh, Wookies, and no Wookies, Ewoks. I wonder what that Wookie is doing on Endor. Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Did I? I'm but, not sure uh, if I misstated the name of the place, or if it's just a coincidence. I didn't. Think no, I, no, I think George Lucas used used the same name. <laughs> I don't think he screwed it up. But I would say quickly because this is a question to you that. Asking anyone for prayer isn't wrong. It works, I think it's a telephone call that no one picks up, but we have no reason to believe that the saints don't have clairvoyance because the saints in the scriptures do have clairvoyance. Um, so that, that would just be my view. Do you have any rejoinder you'd like to say to give you the last word? Uh, no, I, I, you can just have that last word on that. Yep. There you go. Good old last words. So, all right. Um, Looks like Shine Diamond wants some comment on Christology. Do you want to take some maybe time to respond, you know, maybe why fourth century consensus isn't important in Christology? Or maybe you think it is, but then that consensus isn't relevant when it comes to prayer to the saints or how you'd like to nuance that. Or just yeah. say pass. And we'll keep going. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure what he means by press him on Christology. The... Uh, if, if Shining Diamond has something more specific in mind, I'd be curious to hear what, what he had in mind. But I will say this. Uh, the term Theotokos came up in the co context of the question of the deity of the sun. So the calling her Theotokos, it means that she is the God bearer, meaning that even in the womb, Jesus was God. He wasn't, he didn't become God later. They didn't, he didn't dawn deity you know, after some time. He didn't become a God. For, uh, but he was God and man and uh, drawing his humanity from Mary. The, the doctrine, the, the Christological doctrines that are as formulated in uh, various councils are right because they're scriptural. And in fact, that's how they're defended at the time. Uh, not, they're not right because that was what the council said. The, Councils have made mistakes, and there are councils that were ancient councils that were large councils that we reject today. And the the fact that just that a, a lot of uh, bishops gathered together and made a decision, that itself isn't strong enough. They, they need to actually have the truth on their side, and they actually need to have that. In order to be accepted, they ought to demonstrate what they're saying from Scripture. And that's actually the same standard I applied to this discussion we're having now. So, uh, yeah. 
I would concur. Your criteria is that we have to see something's received by the people of God. And the councils that have prevailed have been received by the people of God. That's how we know we're cor they're correct. And uh, so that being said, that's that's why I would say the Christological doctrines were clarified and received by the people of God. There weren't new teachings because I believe the saints teach the scriptures are materially sufficient. But to say that we can then in isolation understand these Christological doctrines without these uh, these insights that have been received by the people of God, I would say would be fundamentally incorrect. Do you want to give a last word? I, I'm, I definitely appreciate the insights of those who went before us in the faith. So I, I'm one of the people who avidly tries to consume the writings from those early centuries. Uh, I generally try to read them in English translation because trying to read them in the original Greek or Latin is is quite challenging and way way slower so at least for me so anyway that's uh i definitely appreciate their insights however their insights are most persuasive when they're accompanied when they're not simply a statement of the fact that the person had that opinion but because they're truthful so an example on the flip side is uh, a s number of church fathers have acknowledged that there was a time when arianism had the majority of the churches. In fact, you know, it, it came to the point where it seemed as though it was just Athanasius among the bishops of the time that was opposing Arianism and everyone seemed to be against him. That's probably hyperbole. Uh, there probably were still a lot of other Orthodox bishops out there, but nevertheless, that's how it seemed. It seemed as though the whole church had become Arian, uh, but that didn't mean Arianism had either become right, uh, nor, do, nor would it have been proof that Arianism was right if it had simply continued for a long time. So thankfully, in God's mercy, the Arian error ended. And even though there's some new sort of uh, new Arians today, ne nevertheless, the, their doctrine isn't scriptural. And that's the ground on which Athanasius fought it for many years after the Council of Nicaea. We will have a show, I think, on August 6th called Revenge of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So we got some ex-Arians coming on <laughs> now bloodfire of london's one of uh one of the protestant intercluders that leave comments it says romans 116 the gospel leads to salvation not the fifth century misinterpretation middle ages mary stuff and i would just say yes the gospel leads to salvation and we believe that the through the prior saints god gives us the grace to repent and believe and that is the gospel so that'd be my comment do you want to make a comment uh no i mean i I, I I certainly agree that it's not the fifth century teachings or the fourth century, the third century, or even the second century teachings that are of critical importance. I think that they, it is useful, though, to read those documents and to ex explore the history and see what actually did happen. What, you know, in what ways did doctrines change over time? In what ways did and were those changes a uh, and uh, let's say a mutation versus which ways were they just a natural development and expansion and, and th more thorough understanding. And those, there is value in church history, even though it, the salvation comes from the gospel that was once handed on in the, in the scriptures in the new Testament. Now I rescind my rejoinder time to give you a question. Question for Turret. Do Protestants have to believe the Bible is from God in an errant is if so, how is this belief enforced to that magisterial authority? So there is no Protestant uh, pope or that can just kick everybody out if they don't follow the rules. Uh, but there, are, you know, most Protestant churches have some form of church government, and there the church government is supposed to uh, be the pillar and support of the truth. That's what the scriptures teach, and they ought to do that, and they ought to remove those who teach false doctrine. Whether inerrancy is a necessary doctrine that someone has to believe in order to be saved, I, you know, I, I would like to say that perhaps inerrancy is, although it's a true doctrine, and although I would see a denial of it as a huge red flag, that the person probably doesn't believe the scriptures, otherwise why are they saying this in itself i can can understand how someone especially a new convert might not even understand the doctrine and might not understand 
the fact that it's a logical implication is that uh, the not the logical implication of the denial would be that God could somehow make a mistake or the Holy Spirit could somehow make a mistake. And that seems to be blasphemous. Uh, now, how is that enforced? Uh, you know, it varies from church to church how to how is it enforced. You know, different churches would take different approaches. I imagine some will probably begin by trying to counsel the person and explain to the person the correct doctrine. And then if after they didn't receive reproof and correction, they would be removed. Now, you, since Protestantism isn't a church, it's just a you know a label that's applied to many different churches. There's no way to kick someone in or out of Protestantism per se. Well, this the Pope of Protestantism, Pope Francis. <laughs> I mean, anyway, that that aside, I would just say it's. I try to personally strike a middle road between it's an absolute existential crisis unless you have some sort of magisterial authority to tell you what the scriptures are, and the view. You don't have you don't need any church or anything to or any context to understand the scriptures are. The scriptures have authority because God spoke them. They have authority the moment they were penned down or the moment the, the word was coming as the pen was hitting the paper. All right. And for Orthodox that are interested, there's extremely important Christological reasons for that, which maybe one day when I maybe do more episodes of my commentary in the book of Job, which is still pending completion, I'll get into. But that aside, you have to understand it's scripture's authority, not because someone gave them authority. They have authority because of who they come from. They come from God. I just argue that ultimately speaking, we're sinful. We receive these things superintended by God through a certain historical context. And I think it would be foolish to say, really, without the fourth century, you would have the context necessary to get a very firm handle on everything that's essential. Um, and that does not mean. I think this includes Second Peter, for example. That does not mean even by the end of Ignatius. So this is like 50 years after the New Testament was written, even a little less. That even by Ignatius' time, you had almost every New Testament book referenced within Ignatius, First Clement, Second Clement. They were all referencing New Testament books. So it's not like there's this existential crisis. What you know? What do we really know? The Bible is. But I think that's to be with confidence. This is what everyone had. You really need to go out to the fourth century because that's when the vast preponderance of the documentary evidence begins. Um, so that'd be my historical point. Um, for unless you feel like Elihu and you're you're a about the burst need to speak for the sake of other questions, I will keep going. Question for Turretin: If the veneration of Mary the Saints historically seems universal by the end of the fourth to the fifth centuries. Why was there no pushback from the fathers if it's not an apostolic practice? I don't think that it's accurate to say there was no pushback on the you know, veneration of the saints, uh, the worship of angels, or the veneration of Mary. I'm not saying there's no pushback on that. And I'm not saying it was almost universal at that uh, as early as the fifth century. It was certainly widespread at that point. I don't know about you. Know, I think Universal is still pushing it too far. But I suppose one aspect of it is, uh, as I said before, first of all, it's very alluring, and it's very, uh, it it's very nice to imagine that we can reach other people, and it, it's a temptation that's common to humanity, and it's a problem that uh, we've seen in the scriptures. We saw the Jews falling into idolatry numerous times, and. If we want to ask the same question, how is it that these judges would come, they judge for 20 years, and then before you know it, immediately the Jews are falling into idolatry again? How could that happen? Well, I mean, the problem is sin. Human beings are tempted by sin, and uh, it, it, that's that's the short answer. So, uh, uh, And I'll give a very short rejoinder, which would just be, we just have no indication that the norm wasn't anything but. And I'll just leave it at that. It's just there's just no indication. It's not a matter of no pushback or any. Just there's just no indication. This just is not what everyone who gave us the scriptures believed. We have every indication that's what they did believe. Um, we have this question. I think you said earlier. This is to you, Turretin fan, that the mm -hmm. fathers of the church were not a apostates for engaging. So what to refer to it as false worship? How do you reconcile this? And of course, if he's misunderstanding you then please say so uh i think the my understanding of 
the heresies is that there are different degrees of heresy. There are heresies that are just er relatively minor, small errors. There are bigger errors, and then eventually there's damnable heresies, the, the ones that are you know errors that are so serious that they undercut the gospel itself. And although I think that it's a very serious uh, sin to offer something that is worship to someone other than God, that nevertheless, I don't think that sin itself is, in every case, a something that prevents someone from being saved. The reason why is oftentimes it's done in ignorance. I don't know of anyone that I've talked to, whether they're Orthodox or uh, Roman Catholic, and I can't recall speaking to anyone who's, let's say, Coptic, for example, but I've never heard of anyone who says, oh, yes, I want to give the worship of God to Mary. Now, I think that the prayers are inappropriate. I think that they are violations of the command that we should worship God only. But I don't think people are doing that in uh, with knowledge. I think they're doing it in ignorance. And I know that uh, many believers ask for uh, forgiveness for sins committed in ignorance. In fact, uh, at least one Orthodox liturgy I've heard specifically re makes request for forgiveness of sins that are ignorant and makes that request to God. So the, uh, I, I don't think that God holds us to a standard of perfect knowledge or perfect obedience. And so even though I do think it is a serious sin, I think it's often done in ignorance. And I don't, uh, I don't see it as something that in itself necessarily separates us from having faith in Christ a saving faith in Christ. Uh, it's Presbyterians. Do they have? Because it says it says Presbyterian on the screen there, guys. But it it means Presbyterian. Do Presbyterians do the Apostle Creed or the Constantinopolitan Creed? I can't remember. Depending on the uh, congregation, they may recite either one or both. Or some some don't recite it at all. Uh, but we would believe the things that are stated there as we understand them, which is not always the same as everybody else understands them. And they usually do read the double procession version. Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, so uh, don't, you know, so I mean, John call Raphael like that cause he's Roman Catholic. But um, that being said, it's, it's just, it's ironic because the, you know, there's this creed that'll be recited in your church and a Lutheran church, a lot of Protestant churches, but the people who wrote the creed, mentioned prayers to saints in their synodical letter. So it's sort of like, that's the part where, you know, it's interesting how much we'll take from them and hold to such high regard, but yet huge aspects of what they believed are, are, are abominable. Uh, I, that I, that I even knew when I was a Protestant is that I thought it was intellectually wrong, but not evil, because how do you think it's evil without like, again, just throwing, almost everything important written by an early Christian into the garbage bail because they're all imbibing this stuff. But I, maybe I'm just an idiot. That's how I thought about it. I'm willing um, to throw the Gnostic writings into the garbage, even though they're interesting to read. Mm -hmm. And I don't, the reason I don't throw the Orthodox writers, at, I mean, I, I mean, lowercase o Orthodox writers into the trash is uh, because I don't, I don't see the same kind of fundamental error in their writings. Now, of course, I would still probably read the Gnostic writings to find out some just what they believed. I'm willing to read books by heretics just to find out what they believed. Uh, uh, but that I would still not accord them the same kind of respect. And I disagree with them not just on this issue. You know, there's there's views on a marriage, for example, that I would find in in let's say Jerome's view of marriage to be uh, quite abhorrent, but his view of the Old Testament canon, I, I, I really love, and I, I end up agreeing with him on that. So you know, there's just the fact that we have some agreements and some disagreements is pretty normal. And I guess it's maybe a little bit easier for people who are in Protestantism because we're used to having to get along with different churches uh, to have you know these early church fathers who aren't, you know they're not Presbyterians, they're not Methodists. They have an Episcopal church stru structure and uh, in it, as, over the centuries, it kind of morphs into various things, but it, depending where they are, but there, it's easier for us to kind of maybe to, to for us to accept that the variation and variety. But ultimately, uh, you know, there are. I, I would love to find you know 
that uh, there's a certain group of people who have always had exactly the same views, but I don't think that's a historical reality. Now, I just want to bring up a comment here, and it's from a future guest, and uh, John Kalarathi, because it reminds me of something Stephen Schumacher talks about. He says, the pushback was against the stories for denying that Mary is the mother of God. And so there is some implication that why would you make that the political fight if the veneration of the mother of God wasn't so big that, right? Because most people can't get their, wrap their minds around the Christological dispute because that's highly theoretical. But yeah, that's not nice to say about Mary, that they could wrap their mind around. So it's it's an interesting point that's not said enough because um, history's made off in that way, but it could also be a point that's overstated. So um, that should be pointed out. And let's see, we got a, da -da -da -da. trying to look for questions. Wait, no, this is a question for, it's not a, it's a question for someone watching. So, all right, no, forget that. He could, he could answer that on his own. Let's see, uh, Tarzan. And this is from an Oriental Orthodox Christian. We Orthodox have been praying to slash with the saints um, for the past 2,000 years. You say it's you say idol worship is a learn. Has it turned into idol worship? Yes. Yeah, so I would respectfully say that John Marco's uh, information is bad. Uh, I don't. That's not accurate. It hasn't been 2,000 years. And he, although it has been a long time, that doesn't uh, doesn't make it right. The fact that it's been going on a long time, if something's been going on a long time, and it's been the wrong thing, and it should be changed, rather than uh, and go back to the earlier tradition, the tradition of Jesus and the apostles. So there's uh, right. when did it become idolatry? You know, the moment it it started. It's the short answer to that. Now, I'm going to put a question again for you because you're more of the curiosity in an Orthodox channel. If I were in a Protestant channel, maybe I'd be the curiosity. Um, Calvin and Luther were idolaters then in Puritan's definition because they got. And what he's referencing are these sort of statements which I don't see complete citations, so I don't know if they're true. Like this one, allegedly from Martin Luther, it is the consolation and the superabundant goodness of God that man is able to exult in such a treasure. Mary is his true mother. We got one from Calvin, supposedly. We cannot enjoy the blessing brought to us in Christ without thinking at the same time at that which God gave as a dormant honor to Mary and willing her to be the mother of his son. I mean, these don't seem to me, they seem to me praise, but not veneration. I mean, do you want to give a response? I guess. Uh well, first of all, I would say Luther is one of those Luther gives and he t and he takes away. Uh, you know, there's there's, <laughs> plenty, <be> Luther. <laughs> there, there's plenty of stuff in Luther that's that's objectionable from a uh, a reformed standpoint, and some of it, especially in early Luther, that was 22, I think, if if the uh, 1522, if I if I saw it correctly, I do. It's not the very earliest Luther, but it's still a fairly early Luther. Uh, and if you look at uh, some of the Protestant reformers, Calvin, for example, seems to uh, believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. Even Francis Turretin, who is sort of the pen name I, I use, he also seems to accept the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, of course, that's uh, and he held, held her in some high regard, of course. But there's one thing to hold a woman in high regard. And you could say he also had perhaps great things to say about Sarah that the New Testament authors do. But it's a bit different between saying, wow, Mary was a remarkable woman or or to say God blessed Mary, which he did. And to call her blessed in that sense, in, in the sense of saying that God blessed her, uh, is one thing. And, and it's another thing to um, light a candle in front of her picture and offer and, and utter a prayer to her in a language she never spoke. Uh, hoping that, as uh, Craig said, that some clairvoyance or similar mechanism will somehow allow her to understand and hear your prayer and answer it and t and take some action on it. I think those are uh, kind of quite worlds apart in, in terms of those two things. And I'm not sure if people appreciate that they are worlds apart or if, if it seems like it's just one continuous spectrum and therefore if you're anywhere on the spectrum, then, you know, it's uh, kind of arbitrary to cut it off. But I, I do see a significant difference between cultists 
and just saying nice things about people, even very thought, very nice things about the people. So. Well, it gets cooler than that because the Orthodox have kolivas, who essentially bake cakes for our dead too. Uh, and, and that includes the saints, but also includes like the anniversary of your dead relative. They, they, uh, so yeah, there's stuff. If Protestant walks with Orthodox church doesn't know what they're looking at, it, it could really scandalize them. The, um, so anyhow, Anthony E. asks you this. So between the fourth century and the Reformation, all Christians successfully maintained the gospel, but incorrectly practiced theology. Now, granted, this is a somewhat loaded question, but that aside, the general sense of it is true. So how, what would your response be to, since the fourth century, this seems to be a very large to a universe, uh, you know, uncategorically universal practice, and you get their scriptures from them, but not their other stuff. What do you have to say to that? Well, let me stop for a second and say uh, the Old Testament scriptures were successfully maintained by the Jews who didn't believe, the Jews who rejected Christ successfully maintained the Hebrew copies of the Old Testament text all through that same period without not only uh, without having perfect theology and not making any errors, they actually rejected Christ and were lost because they rejected Christ. But they nevertheless maintained the scriptures. God finds ways to preserve his word. So if someone were to hold to universal apostasy, which I don't, and I have good reasons from scripture to not to, to believe in universal apostasy, that wouldn't undermine the point that the Gospels were preserved by these people. God can preserve his word, whether it's by unbelieving Jewish hands or by believing Christian hands. Either way, God can still preserve his word. So there's that. But the, uh, the second point of that, I suppose, is I'm not saying that in the fourth century, suddenly everyone started uh, getting horribly off track or even that despite the fact that corruptions definitely did start creeping in in the early centuries. And uh, one of those corruptions was cr a corruption of worship in the sense of adding in veneration of martyrs originally, and then that expanded to other dead believers and, and also expanded to Mary. And uh, in some cases expanded to angels. There's, uh, these are, errors. There's corruptions that spread that came into worship. And yes, the Reformation dealt with some, some of those corruptions, not all of them right away, but, but dealt with some of those corruptions. But yeah, the uh, it's possible for corruptions to creep in. And the appropriate response when we discover that corruptions have crept in is to root them out and return to apostolic tradition. So uh, the fact that it was a few centuries before, or not a few centuries, quite a lot of centuries before some of these errors were uh, corrected, is fine, but uh, that doesn't mean as well that every single church that's, you know, under the umbrella of Protestantism has no theological errors. They, they don't all agree with them, each other on everything. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that uh, that there was like this time of imperfection, and then there's the Reformation, and now there's this time of doctrinal perfection, and everything's perfect. Absolutely not. Humans are still humans, and people still make mistakes. And the the it's a good remedy for us to be continually seeking the scriptures to determine whether what we're teaching and, and practicing and believing is what God taught. It's what Athanasius commended to us. Now, uh, hopefully someone asked me a question. You guys are piling on Turretin fan. Here's another. <laughs> Turretin fan. What ancient liturgical tradition does not include veneration of saints? The one described by Justin Martyr. For example, I don't have it in front of me, but the this the worship that he describes uh, doesn't have any mention of the veneration of saints. All righty, and I, and I would just respond: it's not a complete liturgy, um, but we do have some complete. Uh, well, all the complete liturgical docker doc documents, like the liturgy of Saint James and stuff, they all have invocations of saints, not necessarily advocations, but invocations to the saints. Um, but also we're well aware these liturgical documents have been added to and appended over the centuries as well. Um, though my sympathies are with obviously John Kalarafi, which would be all the liturgical documents have since survived include these things. But uh, we don't have indications like, as you pointed out, Turretin fan, that in Justin Martyr that existed because he just doesn't mention it. It's in um, um, Dialogue with Trifo. So let's see. Miles uh, Natali, 
Why would one expect to find veneration Theotokos in Scripture when she's clearly not the context of what the Bible was written about? And why does this dispro disprove her veneration? So he's saying the Bible's about Jesus, and so why can't we just venerate her anyway? Well, if the question is, can we just venerate her anyway, uh, we, we really ought to follow the traditions given by Jesus and the apostles and not make up our own traditions. I mean, that's, that is taught in the New Testament that we're not supposed to just invent our own traditions, but we should follow the, the teachings of the apostles and our Lord. The, uh, why, would you, uh, why is it significant that the New Testament doesn't provide us with any examples of this? Uh, the significance is that the scriptures are uh, sufficient to instruct us to every good work. You would expect, therefore, that if there's some liturgical practice that's important for us, that it would be mentioned. There is mention of everything else. There's mention of the sacraments. There's mention of, or, or if you prefer to call them mysteries, there, there, there's mention of baptism and the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. There's mention of the singing of praise to God in the New Testament. There's the offering of prayers to God mentioned in the New Testament. But uh, but there is, there's even mention of collections being taken in the New Testament, but there isn't mention of uh, prayers to departed believers in the New Testament, even though there were departed believers very early. And so it's if it were the case that the apostles practiced that, one would expect to see some evidence of it or you know, in the New Testament writings, or perhaps at least in the first few centuries of the church after that. And the, the bottom line is there's very sparse evidence that any of Jesus' followers in those centuries practiced that. All right, so now we uh, be that looks like some of these questions are retreading some ground we've already covered. I will commend people to rewind the debate, listen to it. It may have answered your question. Also, leave questions and comments, and uh, nothing stops Hearts and Fan from answering you later or Blood of London or whomever. So before I give my plug, it, we have your blog linked to in the description. Um, anything else you'd like to plug? you want to tell us about your blog? Uh, my, my, my blog is just a collection of the of thoughts I've had mostly on theological topics over the last decade or so. Uh, so it's it's a scattered scattered reflections. There's a lot of a tag cloud at the bottom that you can hopefully find what you're looking for. Hopefully something relevant there. If you go, it's turtonfan.blogspot.com. There you go. And uh, my question would be like, I'll just don't really get into the issue of orthodoxy. And it seems to me you've at least begun interacting with some of it. And I'd just be interested in just your thoughts. Like, is it just the wicked stepsister of Roman Catholicism? Is it this weird other thing? Uh, do you see something more positive about it? What's your, just your general view of orthodoxy? You're not going to offend me. I, I just use the words wicked stepsister. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly my goal would not be to create any unnecessary offense. I, I think... One of the reasons that there's two main reasons it hasn't been as big a focus. Number one is that there are fewer English speaking Orthodox folks who have been willing to interact over the years. There have been a few. I, I had at least one debate on Sola Scriptura with somebody who is Orthodox many years ago. I think it's on my blog somewhere. Uh, but there, there haven't, they haven't been as numerous as Roman Catholics, uh, for example. So that's one, one aspect. Another aspect is that the 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 structure of orthodox theology as i understand it is somewhat different from roman catholic and protestant theology which it has a more similar structure to it such that the the clash that can occur is it comes with greater difficulty and it's useful to have someone uh, such as yourself who is more familiar with Protestant thought, as opposed to someone, let's say, who's a uh, cradle Orthodox, they might have a lot more familiarity with what their church teaches, but they might not really understand the mapping or the the discontinuity between Orthodoxy and Protestantism. And sometimes people who are former Protestants who escape to Orthodoxy, I think, escape to Orthodoxy 
because of that low either maybe perhaps that local parishes well, i'm not sure if parish is the right term but the local churches um lack of emphasis on theology and greater emphasis on liturgy and uh, in that case they enjoy the worship uh, which is very beautiful very in many cases depending on the kind of orthodox it could be very ornate and very beautiful and very solemn and reverent but uh, Oftentimes, maybe in a two-hour, three-hour service, there might be a five-minute homily. So the emphasis on doctrine and on uh, on scriptural teaching is a lot less. And that, to someone who's leaving Protestantism for Orthodoxy because they like that, they're very unlikely to then turn around and want to debate things because if that's what they're if that's what they were really focused on, then that's not their reason. So I'm assuming that's not the reason that that drew you. Uh, was the smells and bells. Oh, so. anything but. <laughs> that wasn't my reason. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but in some cases, I think it, uh, I think some people find that uh, an attraction. So I don't know. That, that's a, you know, maybe a psychological question or something like that. But And then I guess the final point is, and I said the only two, but there's kind of a third point, which is there isn't an Orthodox Council of Trent. There's, you know, there's some rejection of Cyril of Lucar's, uh, uh, Cyril Lucar's, confession and some challenge of whether he really wrote it and all this kind of thing. There is some of that in orthodoxy, but at the same time, there isn't a, there's only six ecumenical councils. There's not a seventh one that rejects the Reformation. And there have been some orthodox saints whose writings sound almost, let's say, almost Calvinistic. And you could almost be, uh, you could be almost an Episcopalian, uh, Icono dual with uh, a, and otherwise be Protestant and still, you know, somehow fit within the, the framework. Now, I'm I'm not suggesting people should go do that, but I, the 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 absence of an uh, a denial of justification by faith alone, in a way that's absolutely central to orthodoxy. Is, is one important difference between orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. So I feel a, per, I feel less urgency in reaching people who are orthodox because they don't reject the doctrine of justification by faith alone as a matter of being orthodox. They might still reject it, and pe many orthodox people do, but not because they're orthodox. They, they're orthodox and they reject it, not, uh, not because they have to, because their church says so. At least... Uh, that's my understanding. So. Yeah, it's uh, we'll we'll talk up the air, but it's uh, we actually binding conciliar documents in 1642 and 1672 um, that uh, condemn Reformed theology. And the issue, though, is the reason they condemn something like faith alone is different than the reason Roman Catholics will condemn it, and what they mean by faith and works is different than what Roman Catholics mean by faith and works, and and that's what makes things very difficult. But it's a very interesting conversation to be had, and that's why I took it upon myself to write three articles on the doctrine and justification, the Orthodox Church teaching. And to be honest, I'm not aware of anything else quite like it in the English language. And it's specifically because a lot of people haven't read the conciliar documents and St. Maximus and are, understands the Orthodox anthropology and anthro-Orthodox soteriology to properly know what do Orthodox mean by synergy? What do Orthodox believe about what faith does, what works do, you know, and things to that effect. So a real, a real interesting conversation could be had, but I will say this to maybe whet your appetite to Earth and fan, which is the sentiments of Orthodoxy, keyword sentiments, is a lot more like Protestantism. Like we don't believe we merit salvation. Um, we believe that uh, salvation is totally um, by grace through faith um, and that works are not just the evidence of salvation, but it's actually the experience of salvation because we work and will with God, like Philippians 2.12 says, and we believe those works are actually his grace. We call that the essence energy distinction. And so my overall point would be, uh, oh no, now I'm hearing the baby crying, that my overall point would be that even though sentiments could be very similar to Protestants, Protestantism is actually closer to Roman Catholicism because 
Protestantism is a reaction to Roman Catholic Roman Catholic soteriology, and Roman Catholic soteriology is removed by important Orthodox doctrines of grace. And so you kind of get the Protestants trying to reform, right? Try to fix the problems of Roman Catholicism, but they do it removed from the Orthodox Church. And so it creates this kind of interesting difference where the Roman Catholics are actually closer to the truth in in the respect of in a technical sense, because they're they are only once removed from the Orthodox Church. And so, but the Protestants try to fix from Roman Catholicism. They make mistakes in presuming upon certain Roman Catholic views. So as a very quick uh, point would be the treasury merits, right? The Roman Catholic treasury merits, unlike what a 21st century apologist would tell you, Roman Catholic dogma is clear. Um, it's the merits of Christ and the saints, and there's excess merits, and you can tap into it because they don't need so much of it, right? They got an excess of merits, right? Well, why not flatten that and say, well, Christ has infinite merit. So you could tap into Christ's infinite merit. So Protestantism was really fixing the Roman Catholic view of the treasury merits. Well, what if the treasury merits don't exist, period? <laughs> right? Now your whole way of understanding salvation is changed. So it's a, uh, a very interesting issue and a good conversation that could be had nonetheless. I'll just plug quickly for those seeing. Please go to Turton Fans' blog. Check out the videos and channels and stuff and that he's into. He's been doing great work for years and reading the historical sources and making a lot of intelligent commentary, and you have nothing but my respect. I also have a plug for the Orthodox Churches of Cambodia. You go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. There are instructions where you could wire money to the Moscow Patriarchate that has all two and a half, so to say, parishes in Cambodia. There's also a PayPal where every single penny will be sent to the parish of Cambodia where they're translating um, the liturgies. Again, they're approving the translation into Khmer, and we need a few more extra hundred bucks to get it done. So, guys, it would be a blessing if you make it happen. And that is pretty much it. So before we go, I want to give you any last words, Turrets and Pan. Nope. Thanks very much for having me on, and, and thanks for a pleasant debate. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. God willing, we could do it again. And I will end this show as I end all my shows by quoting Jesus of Sirach, who says, fight to the death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a great day.